in order to evaluate techniques and methods of manual control during the reentry phase of the gemini missions a six degree of freedom analog simulation was developed by the flight crew operations division and the spacecraft technology division of the manned spacecraft center this program provided a comprehensive study of the problems involved concerning spacecraft control from three hundred thousand feet to drogue chute deployment at approximately fifty thousand feet and offered a sound basis for establishing procedures to be followed during the astronaut centrifuge training program at the naval air development center johnsville pennsylvania the simulation was performed on two pace 231 r analog computers of the spacecraft technology division the equations programmed on the computer were written with six degrees of freedom to represent a summation of forces and moments along and about the three spacecraft body axes. The control system simulation contained all the jet cross coupling and multiplexing terms which describe its physical characteristics. The aerodynamic forces and moments which were obtained from wind tunnel tests were programmed as functions of Mach number and angle of attack. The simulator cockpit used in the reentry study consisted of a pilot's chair, a partial display panel, and a Gemini hand controller. The control handle was utilized in approximately the same orientation that it will assume in the spacecraft. The display panel consisted of a Gemini eight ball all attitude indicator, an accelerometer, a clock, and a roll rate command light. The Gemini all attitude indicator was controlled by the analog computer and furnished the pilot with visual commands of vehicle attitude rates and control actions to be performed. The capability of altering the Gemini vehicle's flight path and direction during re-entry will produce a marked contrast from the Mercury re-entry concepts with regard to spacecraft control. When the Mercury spacecraft was placed in the re-entry attitude following the retrofire sequence, it assumed a ballistic trajectory to the point of impact. The location of this impact point could be governed only by firing the retro rockets at a precise time with a vehicle at a predetermined attitude. From then until touchdown, the astronaut did not have the capability of altering the vehicle re-entry trajectory. However, during the re-entry phase of the Gemini mission, the pilot will be able to change his flight path and direction during descent and can make both downrange and cross-range corrections. This re-entry control is achieved by displacing the Gemini spacecraft's center of gravity vertically with respect to the center line of the vehicle. This induces a trim angle of attack which produces a lift vector in the opposite direction of the trim angle when the vehicle encounters the atmosphere. The amount of lift obtained is a function of the angle of attack and Mach number of the spacecraft during its descent. If the spacecraft is rolled about its stability axes, the direction of lift is altered with a resultant change of trajectory. It is this modulation of the lift vector that provides the maneuvering capability of the Gemini vehicle. In order to establish a ballistic trajectory, the spacecraft is put into a constant roll rate, which in turn cancels out the lift vector. It will stay in this trajectory as long as the roll rate is maintained. Should further course changes be required, the constant roll rate is terminated and the lift vector is positioned to reflect this course change. The ranging capability of the Gemini vehicle encompasses an area whose boundaries start at the impact point that would be valid if no aerodynamic lift were available and extends to a point where the craft would impact if constant lift were flown during re-entry. The cross-range maneuverability is considerably less than the downrange correction available Therefore, this ranging capability covers an area approximately 500 nautical miles long by 90 nautical miles at its widest point. By a proper modulation of his lift vector, the pilot is able to fly the Gemini spacecraft to any pre-selected target point within this area. To ensure proper modulation of the lift vector to bring the spacecraft to the pre-selected target point, an onboard digital computer in conjunction with an inertial platform makes continuous predictions based on the vehicle's position and velocity for a ballistic trajectory and compares this prediction with the location of the desired landing area. 
It then commands a lift vector orientation that will move the predicted impact point toward the desired target area. This information is presented to the pilot in a visual form, commanding him to modulate his lift vector. The computer will continue to command various roll angles until the predicted impact point coincides with the desired target. At this time, the computer will command a constant roll rate to cancel out the vehicle's lift. If the predicted impact point should drift off the desired target at any time during the remainder of the flight, the computer will command a lift vector orientation that will force the predicted impact point back on target. Thus, from the beginning of atmospheric re-entry at approximately 300,000 feet to approximately 100,000 feet, the pilot is able to make course changes and to correct for such variables as changes in atmospheric conditions and minor errors in retrofire timing and alignment. The eight ball all attitude indicator provides the pilot with visual references upon which to base his control actions. Deflection of the yaw, pitch and roll error needles on the eight ball represent fly to commands to the pilot. For example, the yaw rate needle moving to the left indicates that the spacecraft is yawing to the right. Therefore, to correct this movement, the pilot turns his control handle to the left, commanding a yaw to the left from his thrusters to bring the spacecraft back to the proper orientation. The needle returns to zero when the vehicle has reached the correct attitude and the pilot has returned the control handle to the center position. Pitch corrections are handled in the same manner with the pilot flying toward the needle deflections in order to zero the error. Both the pitch and yaw rate needles are controlled by rate gyros. The pilot is concerned with two basic maneuvers about the roll axis, roll angle correction to orient his lift vector and a constant roll rate to cancel the lift. If a roll rate is commanded by the computer, it is indicated by the roll rate command light located directly above the eight ball. While not presently incorporated on the spacecraft's display panel, this light was used in the simulation to help evaluate techniques of manual control. Direction of the roll is indicated by the roll error needle positioned at the top of the eight ball. This represents roll commands from the onboard digital computer. The pilot responds by establishing a roll rate of 20 degrees per second. The needle returns to zero when the proper roll rate has been obtained. If the roll rate command light is out and the roll error needle deflects, the pilot is informed that a roll angle correction is necessary in the direction of the needle movement. The pilot takes appropriate action and the needle returns to zero when the proper attitude is achieved. To simulate the onboard computer, the roll error indicator was operated by signals from the analog computer and reflected a programmed roll profile. While the needle deflections indicate the control actions that the pilot should make, the movements of the calibrated sphere or eight ball indicate the orientation of the spacecraft. Prior to retrograde, the inertial guidance system, which controls the eight ball, is aligned along the longitudinal axis of the spacecraft with the local horizon. Movements of the eight ball from then on are in relationship to the inertial position at retrograde. To illustrate the movement of the eight ball as viewed by the pilot from retrofire to drogue chute deployment, this sketch shows a typical re-entry profile. Notice the position of the eight ball at retrofire, which occurs at approximately 950,000 feet. The eight ball indicates that the spacecraft has yawed 180 degrees and pitched down 16 degrees, placing the heat shield forward and the pilot in an upright position. After retrofire, the spacecraft is rolled 180 degrees to orientate the lift vector prior to re-entry, thus placing the pilot in an inverted position. As the spacecraft traverses the Earth, the eight ball moves to indicate the angular rotation of the vehicle. When the spacecraft enters the atmosphere at approximately 300,000 feet, its velocity is decreased and pitchover becomes more pronounced. A total of seven different simulations were run with each astronaut. Data were recorded that provided a time relationship between the computer program and the pilot's response to the control problems. 
Two eight-channel recorders were used to provide a complete time history of each simulated flight in regard to such parameters as the altitude of the vehicle, Mach number, dynamic pressure, fuel consumption, forces along the three body axes of the spacecraft, and integrated value of the pilot error. The pilot's response was plotted against a pre-programmed roll profile. Each astronaut flew the simulated mission in both of the manual control modes, rate command and direct. In the rate command mode, oscillations of the vehicle are automatically damped about all three axes with dead bands of plus or minus one degree per second in roll and plus or minus two degrees per second in pitch and yaw. The spacecraft can oscillate within the limits of these dead bands, but any movements beyond them will be automatically corrected. The pilot's response to the computer's commands are indicated here by the green trace over the pre-programmed roll profile. In this mode, there is a linear relationship between control handle deflection and the commanded rate of vehicle movement up to a maximum of 20 degrees per second. Due to the automatic damping and the linear response characteristics, the rate command is the easiest of the two modes to fly. However, it consumes the most fuel. More conservative of fuel, but more difficult to fly, is the direct or fly-by-wire mode. This is an on-off situation where the pilot controls the thrusters directly. Neither automatic damping nor linear response is available to him. The pilot's response in this mode is shown by the red trace superimposed over the green rate command history. This simulation indicates that the astronaut is capable of maintaining good control in the direct mode during the Gemini re-entry, and if fuel economy should become a factor at that time, it might prove to be the more desirable of the two. A measure of the pilot's ability to fly the pre-programmed roll time history is shown as a difference between commanded pilot input and actual spacecraft movements. Fixed mission flight simulators such as this are typical of the intensified research being conducted by the Manned Spacecraft Center, which enables engineers and scientists to properly evaluate methods and techniques of manual control prior to an actual re-entry flight.